Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, next Sperry public event in the university and the city. My name is Tony Payne, and I'm one of the directors of Sperry, which stands for the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute. Sperry was, was set up just about two years ago to uh, seek to develop new ways of thinking about the economic and political challenges posed for us all by the current almost wicked combination of global financial crisis, shifting economic power to Asia, and growing environmental threat. And in those two years, we've tried to do quite a lot of thinking and to uh, publicize quite a number of ideas about that situation. We've initiated something called Sperry Comment, the political economy blog, which now has two or three new posts every week. We've started online Sperry papers, <coughs> of which the nine have been published with the 10th due any day. We've held two major conferences and a, work, uh, and a research workshop with a further conference due this summer and four more workshops planned. We've signed a contract for a series of Sperry books with the publisher Palgrave and the first two e-books in that series have been published. And just lately, we've started a new publication called British Political Economy Briefs, which are short underlying, which are short comments on the underlying condition of the British economy, uh, one of which was published this week and comprehensively misunderstood and abused in the Scottish political uh, debate about the economy, but that's politics. Within the university and the city, we also run public events, as you know, including an annual lecture series, occasional seminars and book launches. And for the first time last year, perhaps some of you were here, we rather tentatively tried out something called an in-conversation evening, in which two eminent people just talked to each other in front of an audience, hopefully as if they were just chatting away on late night television or on sofas in their home. It seemed to work, we got some quite good reactions and so here we go again with the same format. Two sofas, two eminent people, uh, a jug of water and you, the audience. So my remaining job is just to introduce to you the two guests because since it is a conversation there clearly have to be two guests. Our main guest on the furthest sofa, if I can put it that way, is Andy Haldane whose official position is Executive Director for Financial Stability at the Bank of England. That makes him very senior and very important, but it doesn't fully explain why he's also so very interesting. And he's interesting because over the past few years of financial crisis, since those extraordinary days in the autumn of 2008, Andy has established a very distinctive reputation for speaking out and for speaking out in sometimes unorthodox fashion about the key contemporary issues of regulation and proper uh, attainment of financial stability. For example, he gave a speech in 2010 in which he dared to put a figure, turned out to be a huge figure, to the broad cost to the British economy of the banking crisis. And he also was bold enough to identify the hidden subsidies that banks receive year in, year out from the British public. He's even said publicly that the Occupy movement has been right to be critical of the workings of the global financial system. He espouses what is known in political economy as the macro prudential turn in the management of global finance, which perhaps he'll have cause to explain in the conversation, but which in essence recognizes that somebody or some institution has to be responsible for the stability of the system as a whole at the macro level, rather than just thinking it's sufficient to worry only about the viability of individual banks and financial enterprises at the micro level. All in all, as the independent newspaper dubbed him in a profile last December, he is the coming man of British banking, they said. They also discovered that in his youth he had been a bit of a fast bowler. Uh, and the Independent ended the article by saying uh, that we should all be relieved that Andy was now bowling for the British public. 
So perhaps, Andy, you could fit in winning back the ashes as well as rescuing the global banking system. Andy is a Yorkshireman, uh, born in Guiseley, and we're very proud also to say that he is a Sheffield alumnus, graduating in economics and finance uh, in 1988. After taking an MA at Warwick, he joined the Bank of England in 1989 and has risen through the ranks, holding responsibility for risk assessment, market infrastructure and international finance before taking up his present position as Executive Director for Financial Stability in 2009, a pretty unstable time. In that same year, he also founded a charity known as Pro Bono Economics, which aims to link economists to projects in the charitable sector. So we're absolutely delighted, Andy, to have you back here in Sheffield, at Sperry, and indeed in the university as a whole. Our other guest on the nearer sofa, unannounced as it were in the pre-event publicity, will be known to some of you um, because he is Professor Andrew Gamble, Professor of Politics at the University of Cambridge, uh, a former and long-standing Professor of Politics at this university, and now I'm very pleased to say he's the Chair of Sperry's International Advisory Board. Now, Andrew, I don't know how I persuaded him, but I, I managed to persuade him to agree to be the conversationalist at last year's In Conversation event, and he played the role that I've told him that he's backed by popular demand to do this tonight. Uh, and uh, indeed, I want him to do it again, should we have future In Conversation evenings. And I think it's good to put this invite to him in front of you all so that by your laughter you can confirm that it, there is indeed popular demand and Andrew will be back perhaps in, in due course. Uh, Andrew is himself one of the most distinguished academic political economists in the country. Last year I wasted a few minutes for the audience by reading out the titles of his many books and I won't repeat them all now other than perhaps to direct you to his most recent book uh, entitled A Spectre at the Feast, Capitalist Crisis and the Politics of the Recession, published by Palgrave in 2009. It's a brilliantly pithy account of how we got into the mess we're in. Uh, and Andrew hasn't rested there. It's about to be followed by a new updated, revised, newly titled version of that argument later this year. So Andrew, you two are very welcome back in the university which you served with such commitment for so long. So I'll get off the stage now, invite Andy and Andrew to begin their conversation. After a while, Andrew will draw in questions from the audience, and then at the end, as we wind up, I will just pop back up here for a moment to uh, offer thanks and close the proceedings. So over to Andrew and Andy. Hey, well, thanks, Tony. Um, it's a great pleasure to be, to be back here. And uh, what we're going to do is just have, as Tony says, we're just going to have a conversation. Uh, we're going to cover quite a number of different topics. And hopefully then that will lead naturally into a Q&A um, and bring people in in the, uh, in, in, in the last half of the evening. So Andy, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I thought we could start by talking about economics and political economy. Um, okay. okay, is that better, everyone? Um, so, what do you think should be the relationship between economics and political economy? Uh, a lot of the things you've written um, in, in um, speeches and, and articles You've talked about how you're dissatisfied often with the state of economics and that you want economics, you think economics should be much broader. Can you say a little bit about what you, what you mean by that? Thank you, Andrew. I'd be satisfied by thanking Tony for that introduction and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so um, I think my profession, economics, with the benefit of hindsight, took a false turn in the road for actually much of the 20th century, uh, which is a long time to take a false turn in the road. Um, why do I say that? Well, um, 
if you go right back to the very beginning, so economics is probably a, a discipline, a profession that originated in the 18th century. Uh, the father of economics is often spoken of as being uh, Adam Smith. And Adam Smith um, would not be recognizable today as an economist because his sphere of influence, his interests, spanned absolutely political economy, uh, moral philosophy, what today would be called sociology, anthropology, in addition to economics. But we saw through from you know, Adam Smith's early writing, as we entered the 20th century, economics plowing a somewhat narrower furrow. What went wrong? Well, I think one of the things that went wrong is that economists read the wrong book by Adam Smith. Okay? So the book that everyone knows by Adam Smith is called The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. And the reason economists like it is because it says the best we can do for society is by having everyone pursue their own self-interest. So some combination of selfishness plus competitive markets achieves via some loaves and fishes miracle the best outcome for society. And that Smith message, that wealth of nations message, was very much taken to heart by economists through much of the 20th century, in particular its second half. So economists built models founded on individual people seeking to do the best for themselves, or individual firms trying to maximize their own profits, on the assumption that if everyone did that individually, that the collective outcome would be the best that could be achieved for society. And actually, um, what events have shown us, certainly over the course of the last four or five years, is that leaving people to pursue their own individual self-interests in highly competitive markets might not lead always to the best outcomes for society. And that is not a new lesson. Because 17 years prior to writing The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith had produced a second book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, much, much, much less well known, largely unread by the economics profession, though actually quite widely read outside of economics. And what that book puts center stage are a rather different set of lessons the importance of cooperation in addition to competition, the importance of reciprocity, of fairness, of values, plural, as distinct from value, singular. And those are, you know, if the 20th century was the century of the wealth of nations, I think, in the light of the crisis, the 21st might be one in which Smith's first book begins to take center stage. And already we see some of that happening with economics broadening, throwing open its arms in the light of the crisis to a wider set of disciplines, political economy, sociology, anthropology, the natural sciences. This is back to the future. This is back to Smith, and it's very much welcome. I mean, uh, I know you've also talked about um, what you call the intellectual toolkit which economists use, and it reminded me reading that that uh, Joseph Schumpeter, when he was at Harvard, um, said that the economist needed to have a, a training in advanced um, economic theory training in econometrics, a training in statistics, but also a training in economic history and a training in economic sociology. And, and yet you think, well, you know, how, how many of us are actually capable of mastering so many different fields when 
all the pressures in, in modern intellectual life are towards uh, specialization. Do you think there's a way of uh, getting a broader toolkit? And what do you think that toolkit, what do you think the modern economist really needs as a toolkit for addressing today's problems? So I think one of the, uh, Andrew, one of the, the real silver linings from the, uh, the dark cloud of the last few years has been that it's drawn people in to thinking about this set of problems. Uh, people from outside of economics, from natural sciences, from other social sciences. They have seen this, what has been a catastrophic outcome for the world. They are thirsty to know how to make sense of it, which is why you know, applications to economic, economics from, in universities have gone through the roof. Uh, and the students are hungry for a different set of tools, a different kit with which to make sense of it. So change is happening from below, uh, and that will change things above, I hope, in time. What form might that uh, change? Uh, take. Well, let me shout out a couple of thoughts to get us started. Um, economists suffered a long period of physics envy. Okay? They wanted, uh, Keith's nodding in the front row as a physicist, um, they wanted bits of kit, ways of making sense of the world that were rigorous, that were founded on some deep theory, some deep axioms that then led to conclusions that were logically infallible. That was the quest through certainly the second half of the 20th uh, century. And, and the truth is, when you move from natural to social sciences, it's difficult to achieve such an infallible set of proofs. And it, even in the natural sciences, those infallible proofs sometimes rarely exist. There is a wedge of not knowing, a wedge of ignorance, a wedge of uncertainty. And in economics and finance, that wedge is very considerable uh, indeed. So taking seriously not knowing, taking seriously ignorance, and knowing how best to perform policy or to understand the world, given that ignorance, is really important. Um, so, um, rather than seeking out some universal truth, some infallible theory, economists could, perhaps should, be a bit more humble and say, look, what I will do instead is just take the data, all of the data, and hammer it till it gives me a message. I'll try and extract the essence, the story. I'll go in without strong thoughts on what's right or wrong, what is a good theory, what's a bad theory, but instead tease out of the data what might be going on, what you know, methodologists might call an inductive approach, letting the data talk, rather than a deductive approach, starting with some high theory and then testing it. Economists in the main and finance theorists in the main have been heavily deductive. Starting with theory and then taking that theory to the data. Why not start with the data? That will be a, a mini revolution for economics and finance, even though it's standard fare in most other professions. It'll certainly be a revolution. <laughs> the, uh, it reminds me that uh, I was chatting to uh, at Cambridge to a couple of uh, of uh, economics postgraduates who both transferred from physics, and I was asking them how they were getting on, and they said to me, uh, they said, well, we haven't quite understood what economists are doing with, with their models, you know, they, because we're told that the, the assumptions we can't, we can't challenge, but in physics we were told we had to challenge the assumptions all the time. And, and it sort of encapsulates for me the part of the intellectual problem. Um, but let, let's move now, let's go on to the, the financial crisis of, uh, of 2007-8. Um, I mean, it's uh, um, five years ago now, or six years really, um, since it all began, and, uh, and 
now we're getting some distance from it. I think we're, we're beginning to see just what a major event it was. Um, although it didn't have the catastrophic consequences that events like this have sometimes had in, in the past. Um, but I think it'd be interesting if, if uh, you would set out from your perspective uh, what, why you think the financial uh, crisis happened. And, um, and perhaps answer you know, the famous question from the Queen, uh, why, why, did no one, why did no one see this coming? Which she, which she said to a rather bemused audience at, in, in the LSE. Um, and I think it would just be, I think it's those two things. It's why, why did it happen? But also, why did no one see it, see it coming? Or did they? Mm. They didn't. They didn't. I mean, you may have seen appearing on the bookshelves um, dozens, actually, of books now on the crisis. Um, in the main, from people who did see it coming, they claim, um, after the fact. Uh, let me tell you, they didn't. They didn't. Many of them are my friends, and uh, in the main, we all got it wrong. Certainly, the magnitude we, we got wrong. Uh, and that's because the magnitude uh, is, is off the scale. Um, I mean, you're right, Andrew, that you know, previous, cri previous crises have uh, often torn the social fabric in a greater way than has been the case this time. Uh, but one feature that did distinguish this time from any previous crisis, any previous crisis, is that this one was truly global. This was the first ever, first ever, genuinely global financial crisis. The Great Depression did not have the same global reach as events the last uh, five years. And that is very striking. That's very striking. So back in September 2008, what we saw for the first time ever was that pretty much without exception, every country on the planet fell off the same cliff edge at the same time in roughly the same amount. We haven't seen that before. That's never happened previously in any financial crisis. I certainly have studied in the history books. And begs the question, why? Why was this time different? Why was this time different? Because it was. And the answer for me lies in the much deeper level of financial joined upness, integration in the language we use as economists, and the much greater degree of informational joined upness. So if you ask me why was it that you know, China and India fell as far as the UK and the US, my answer is it was informational contagion. It was a CNN effect. It was waking up to the news that no bank in the world might be safe. And that prompted everyone, pretty much everyone globally, to sit up, pay attention, worry, and to save their money rather than spending it, which is why we have had what has become known as the Great uh, Recession. Now, what is the lesson from that? What lessons do we take away? Well, the big one for me, and the big thing we all got wrong, is that that joined upness, that integration of markets globally, is a genuinely double-edged sword. When it works well, it works really well. And in that 10, 20, perhaps 30 year period prior to the crisis, that joining up, that development, that integration worked superbly well for the world. We enjoyed an almost unparalleled period of stable growth and low inflation in the West. And we told stories about how risk had been scattered to the four winds, it had been diversified away care of financial innovation and financial integration. And that was all true right up to the point where it wasn't 
because integration, financial joint upness, is a double-edged sword, and in 2008 we fell on the wrong side of the knife edge. Because as joined upness can serve as an insurance device in good times, it can also serve as an incendiary device in bad times. Contagion becomes the negative. Spillovers become adverse, and that is why this time was different. That is why we had a crisis with a breadth, certainly, and depth, possibly, that we haven't seen previously. And that's a big lesson. That's a big thing we all got wrong. In the language used by uh, the natural sciences and some of the social sciences, we now have a global financial system that exhibits knife-edge properties that is, at the same time, both robust, yet fragile. Robust when the going is good, and fragile when it takes a turn for the worst. And that's, for me, the biggest thing that pre-crisis we got wrong. Isn't it, this could have been averted. I mean, I mean there, were, there were models, right? I mean, there were people like Hyman Minsky who'd actually talked about the instability of, uh, of financial systems. Um, yeah. it, do you think that there is any way, I mean, so I suppose the, my question is, do you think it was inevitable that this crisis was going to unfold once certain preconditions were in place? Um, or was there any point at which it might have been um, arrested, that someone might have uh, stepped in, regulators or governments or... Mm -hmm. Well, um, the intellectual failure, the intellectual herding, actually, uh, that I just discussed, was widespread. It was a collective intellectual failure. For sure, there's other things going on, driving the crisis, but in, in general, at root, this was us all having, you know, this is risk managers in banks, it is uh, regulators of banks. We all had, roughly speaking, the wrong model uh, in, uh, in our heads. Um, now, some of this was foreseeable. And indeed, some of this, to a degree, was foreseen. Because prior to the crash, we had credit bubbles emerging in a whole bunch of countries, certainly in this country, in the US, in much of the West, actually. And Minsky's work, the work that Andrew mentioned by Hyman Minsky, makes absolutely crystal clear, and history is absolutely crystal clear, that credit bubbles go pop, and when they do, more often than not, a crisis accompanies them. That much we should have learned from the history books, and that much we should have got right, and there were some people making just that case ahead of the crisis. I think the part that we all missed was how big is the collateral damage to the economy, to the financial system, when that credit bubble does go pop? And that's where this joined upness, this integration, this global web that had emerged over a 30, 40 year period really took us all by surprise. Okay. Um, can you hear now? Okay. Right. Sorry. Um, so let, let, let's take go on from that to uh, lesson. Um, you, you said about learning lessons from it. Um, I wonder how much has actually changed since the crash. I mean, how much do you think that, that lessons have really been learned? How how much do you think that there has been? Uh, a, a real process of reform in financial regulation. How, how confident are you that um, we're not just returning to business as usual, that we've actually put in place measures that will stop a, a similar crisis happening again? Mm -hmm. uh, let me be optimistic. Um, because I think um, 
uh, a lot has been done. And as importantly, and I hope, hopefully more durably, um, the way people are conceiving of solutions has changed quite a lot over the course of the last five years. Regulators do not move at the speed of light. Um, no great surprise there to anyone in the room, I imagine. Uh, but during the course of that five, six year period, I think many of us have been moving through a gradual uh, and elegant 180, uh, one degree at a time, okay? Uh, and let me give you one or two examples of how that's been the case. So um, back in 2005, 2006, we told a story about the world's biggest banks being safer than the world's smaller banks. Why do we say that? We told a story about risk being diversified, spread around across a bigger balance sheet. Uh, and that meant that as regulators, we were willing to allow those big banks to run with smaller cushions, less protection, less insurance than their smaller brethren. That was a grade one uh, intellectual mistake because it confused the probability of a bank going bust with the impact, the collateral damage that comes from a big bank getting bust. And we all now know that when big banks go bust, they cause much more collateral damage than smaller ones. That is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, why the recession in this country uh, was as large uh, as it was. What does that mean? Well, that means on average, you should require your biggest and most complex institutions to run not with smaller protection, but to run with larger protection to protect the system as a whole. Had we read, had economists as a profession uh, been a little bit more cognizant, a little bit more aware of, say, the lessons from epidemiology, we'd have known that. So back in the early 70s, there was, for example, a debate about the optimal approach for vaccinating against diseases, for example, HIV AIDS. Was it to just randomly vaccinate everyone in the population? Or was it to target that vaccination, to target that protection? And it was concluded then, on the basis of fairly simple models, that the smart approach was to target, in particular, to target those individuals who risk spreading the disease elsewhere in the population, to target the super spreaders, which is what was done in the context of HIV AIDS and had a huge benefit in consequence. That lesson reads across one-to-one -to, -one to dealing with global banks. They are the super spreaders of the global financial system. Therefore, we need an average to vaccinate them, to have them put in place greater protection. And that we are now doing. And that is just one example of this elegant 180 through which regulatory thinking has moved over the course of the last five years. And what would you say was the most important of those measures? I mean, is it, is it high leverage ratios? Is that, is that the main thing that you think needs to change for the future? It, it's one of the things that we are doing. Yeah. Um, so, um, roughly speaking, um, so imagine you're a bank, okay? and you've got 100 pounds worth of assets. Um, now, there's always some risk, especially with bank assets, that some go bad. So you want to set aside some money, what in regulatory speak we called capital or equity, such that if those loans go bad, the bank doesn't go bust. Okay? So what would be a reasonable amount of money 
giving you 100 pounds of assets to set aside to try and guard against a big bank uh, going bust. Well, I won't ask for answers from the audience, but roughly speaking, pre-crisis, those big banks were holding at most one or two pounds for every hundred pounds of loans they were making. You can see how building a system on that foundation won't make it especially sturdy. If the assets, the value of the assets of that bank, fall by as little as one or two percent, that bank is bust. And depositors in that bank will get scared and will run, as we saw in many countries. So a big lesson was indeed that the leverage, which is the flip side of what we've been discussing in this institution, was too high, far, far too high to be a safe foundation stone for a financial entity of any type. And one of the big reforms has been to pump up those cushions of capital, especially so for the uh, bigger banks from perhaps one or two to closer to three or four. That doesn't sound like it's too high, although judging by the squeals from some in the banking profession, that feels quite tight to them. So uh, the question is still begged. We are doing better, but are we doing as well as we should? And I think, I mean, that leads on to another sort of set of questions, really, about, you mentioned um, too big to fail. Um, you've mentioned, you've talked about fairness. Obviously, what a lot of people feel about the financial crisis and, and, and the role of the banks in it is that uh, there have been these huge transfers to the banks um, from the public purse. And what a lot of people ask is, what have people got back for it? Um, I mean, I was, I was struck the other day hearing Chris Smith on the, uh, um, as, as chair of the, the, the embattled chair of the <laughs> Environmental Agency, saying that, well, the problem was that uh, for flood defenses, the, um, the treasury rules were that uh, uh, for every pound spent, you had to have uh, eight pounds of benefit. Uh, an eight to one ratio. And I just thinking in relation to the, the banks, I mean, the huge sums that have been put in, um, is the return that the taxpayer is going to get, um, is it worth it? I mean, is it, uh, is actually the, uh, um, the cost of shoring up the banking system the way we've done it, is it actually, uh, is, it, is, it, is it fair to, to taxpayers? Is it fair to all the other things that that we could have, we, we could have been doing. Um, is, is there a way of uh, of making the our banking system um, legitimate in the eyes of the public when such huge transfers have had to be made to shore up something which uh, people didn't think um, mm. weren't expecting was going to have to be done? Mm. Well, I think Andrew, your question probably breaks down into two bits. Was it the right thing to do, and was it fair? Uh, now, was it the right thing to do? I mean, we don't know for sure. But my hunch, you know, my presumption is that you know, had the UK government and, and most other governments globally not ridden to the rescue to shore up the balance sheets of the banks, given the state they'd reached in 2008, that the outcome for the economy, for wider society, would have been a lot worse than even we have seen. That, that would be my starting point. That the support... It'd been like 1929. It'd been like 1929, and we'd have <laughs> multiple bank failures and you know, unemployment going to levels you know, last seen at the time of the Great uh, Depression, uh, with the accompanying long-term adverse social repercussions. So given where we'd reached, I think uh, what was done was somewhere between necessary and essential to prevent a much greater 
raveling economically, financially, socially, even than we have seen. Was that fair? Absolutely it was not. Um, in, in the grand scheme of things, um, what we saw was, in too many instances, was the upside being harvested by the financial sector and the downside uh, being taken by wider society. And that is unjust and wrong and intolerable. And the reform agenda is about removing us from that hook. We cannot afford, we cannot afford both metaphorically and literally to have this happen again. Society will not tolerate a repeat performance of what we have seen. I am very clear in my own mind about that. Um, what is it we need to do to get us um, off that hook? Well, we need to tackle this problem that you alluded to, Andrew, of too big to fail. So you cannot have capitalism without failure. That's like having politics without elections. It just can't work. Capitalism without failure is communism. And the banking market over the last 100 years, actually in this country, has exhibited far too little entry, new banks coming in, and far too little exit, banks failing because of the too big to fail problem. We need to solve both ends of that problem. New banks coming in, and in particular, larger banks being allowed to fail if they uh, screw up. What does that mean? Well, um, one thing we need to have in place is a mechanism to enable us to wind down, to liquidate a big bank if it hits catastrophe. What we call a resolution regime, a procedure that says, look, we understand that some bats of banking can't be just liquidated. So you can't just leave depositors to themselves, to fend for themselves. Society won't tolerate that. So we need some special way of treating depositors, and then some other way of dealing with the other assets and liabilities. That's what an orderly resolution regime would look like. And it would get the taxpayer, get the government, off the hook for having to write the check. And that's one of the key themes of the reform agenda that we've put in place over the last few years. Um, just tell you something else you, you were talking about, about uncertainty. Uh, it seems to me that the, obviously, uh, you know, the, um, everyone is talking now about how the distinction between risk and uncertainty is key, and that we should never have uh, forgotten about the nature of uncertainty um, in the way that uh, some, some of the models uh, did. But it, it always leaves me with a puzzle because um, the whole thing about uncertainty is that we can't measure it. Um, it's not like risk. Uh, but we know it exists. We know it exists in complex social systems. Yeah. And so my question is, can we ever guard against it? Or are we, are we forever going actually to reckon with that however good we are at solving the last crisis and putting things in place, that there's always going to be something which we don't spot, mm -hmm. which comes along and, 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 and hits us in the future? And is there any way that we can build into our, into our regulatory systems um, uh, some sort of intelligence that can actually um, not predict uncertainty because that's a, uh, it's a nonsense. Uh, it does, doesn't make sense. But but at least find a way of, uh, of of alerting us to the existence of uncertainty. But it's a, it's an ever present uh, aspect of our uh, of our social system. Mm. Uh, I think so. I think so. And let me try and explain um, why why I think so. 
So this is the distinction between risk and uncertainty, um, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Um, it's an old Frank Knight distinction from the 1920s, and it's roughly the distinction between uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns in, in Rumsfeld speak. Uh, now that distinction sounds subtle, but actually has really, really profound implications for what to do. If all you face is risk, that is to say, uh, known unknowns, then more information is always better. And complex rules always beat simple rules. Okay. And that was just the trap into which many of us fell uh, pre-crisis. So we developed ever more complex models to try and make sense of the world, to try and make sense of risk. Complex models of the economy, complex models of financial risk. And let me tell you, uh, both such models fared spectacularly badly when the big one came. We failed materially to make sense of the path of the economy, and we failed uh, even more significantly to predict the onset and scale of the crisis. So those very precise models were also very precisely wrong. And that's because we were working uh, with a model of risk. And those models made no allowance, we made no allowance, for uncertainty, for not knowing, for those unknown unknowns. And interestingly, as soon as you take seriously not knowing, those rules of thumb I mentioned get flipped on their head. In a world where you don't know, more information is not always better. And simple rules often trump complex ways of making decisions. When you really don't know, simple rules of thumb, simple heuristics, can on average do a better job than more complex ways of making uh, decisions. So a couple of examples maybe to, to bring that out. Um, there are lots, lots of studies of this. So let's say we were sitting round. Let's say it was the first round of a, um, one of the big tennis tournaments. Uh, and I put in front of you all uh, the list of first round games. Okay. Uh, and then asked all of you to pick winners from each of those games. Uh, and then added up, added up the results and compared your predictions to the predictions that would come from the ATP rankings. Those ATP rankings are generated very, by a very complex algorithm. If you're in a horse race between those two things, it has been found, on average, that your view, the wisdom of crowds, would outperform, often significantly, this complex algorithm. Uh, why is that? Because when you're scoring each game, most of you, you're using something very simple, you're using a very simple rule of thumb, which is, do I recognize the name of the person? You will go with the man or woman whose name you recognize. You will use what in the jargon is called the familiarity heuristic, what you know. And it turns out the familiarity of heuristic does pretty well, not least because it embodies lots of information from the past. That's why you are familiar with the name. And that's why it often proves a more robust basis for decision making than a very complex algorithm that may sway with the smallest statistical breeze, which may be based principally on information over the last six weeks rather than over the last uh, six years. So in many spheres of decision making, simple beats complex when you don't know what you're doing. And when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the financial sector, some of the time, perhaps much of the time, you can't know exactly uh, what you 
are doing. Second example, one I've used in uh, papers. Um, uh, catching a Frisbee is, as Keith would certainly tell us, if you write that down as a, as a physics problem, it's actually very complicated to write down as a, uh, as, as a physics problem. Uh, and if we try to solve that problem, at the same time we were catching a Frisbee, we would on average be very, very unsuccessful indeed. So how is it that we do catch Frisbees? How is it that Border Collies are better at catching Frisbees than our humans? Which is a fact that I'm sure none of you will deny. Uh, and the truth is the Border Collie uh, uses the same simple heuristic that, that we do. It uses, in this case, the gaze heuristic, which is basically run at an angle, uh, run in a direction so the angle of gaze to the frisbee remains constant. It's not the optimal way of doing it, but it, on average it gets you the right answer. On average it's the reason that the border collie outperforms uh, the human. The border collie, on average, will not be an expert on Newtonian physics. It will follow that simple rule of thumb, given what it does know. And wherever you look, you can turn to the sphere of finance and get the, the self-same set of predictions, which is that when you don't know, don't go too smart, don't go too complex. Keep it simple, and on average, you'll do better. Bank of England um, and, and its role because there's. Sorry. I keep forgetting, I'm sorry. Um, the Bank of England and its role because I think that this is a really. Um, I mean, it seems in recent years that the Bank of England has become much more important again. I mean, at one time it was very important in, uh, in British public life. Um, then it seemed to go through a phase when uh, it wasn't so important, but in recent years, uh, and, and with being entrusted with a whole lot of new uh, responsibilities, it's becoming much more important again. And this isn't happening just in, in, in the UK, but it's happening in many countries, that central banks are on the, are, are on the rise. Um, and I wonder what you think about this, and, and uh, whether, um, because some people have argued that uh, putting, uh, uh, allowing central bankers to take decisions rather than elected politicians is actually to put uh, decisions in the hands of, of, of technocrats and not of the people that ought to, um, that are directly accountable to electorates. So I wonder um, what, you, what you feel and whether, whether you feel that uh, this is a necessary um, development in the light of what's happened, that we actually need to empower central banks more uh, to govern the financial system, or whether you think there are dangers and it could go too far? So um, I think your description, Andrew, is a perfectly fair one. Um, I mean, the fortunes of central banks have waxed and waned over the last 100 years, 200 years. And um, so, so my institution is. 319 years old. Um, but for the first 200 years, there wasn't much that you'd recognize as central banking going on. Um, we are just like any other high street bank, actually, in the main competing with the banks. And then roughly 150 years ago, um, the central bank, central banks globally, certainly central banks in this country, began to do more of the things that look like central banking of which the first thing was to be the monopoly supplier of cash, of notes and, notes and coin. Uh, and the second thing, which happened towards the back end of the 19th century, was that we started to supply money to banks that were in trouble on a temporary basis, what we call lender of last resort, of which there's been a lot over the last few years uh, globally. So at that stage, we were, we were controlling the money, and we were supplying that money 
to the banking system. It was a short step from that during the course of the 20th century to be setting interest rates, the price of money, which is, again, another responsibility that central banks took on to an increasing degree over the course of the 20th century, culminating in this country in the Bank of England being handed independence for setting interest rates uh, back in 1997. So there's been a steady accretion of powers and responsibilities over the last 150 or so years. It's waxed and waned, but around a steadily rising trend. And if you look at the number of central banks that existed at the start of the 20th century, compared with the end, they grew like crazy. As nation states were put in place, part of that state building typically involved the invention, the creation of a central bank. Now, the crisis uh, we've been living through, I think, has meant that those powers, if anything, those responsibilities, will be further on the up. And the particular responsibility that's come central banks' way during the course of the last few years has been the prevention and management of crises, which is this word that Tony used, this macro-prudential word that Tony used at the, at the very beginning, which is thinking about monitoring and managing the financial system as a system. That is new, and that new thing, that new responsibility, has in the main been vested in central banks. Is that a step too far? That was your question. Is that a step too far? Um, I almost have to say no, uh, given that it's a responsibility the Bank of England took on statutorily uh, in April last year. But I think the right answer is uh, that that crisis monitoring, that crisis mitigation, does more naturally fall to an arm's length from government institution. In the same way as monetary policy most naturally falls to an institution that is arm's length from politics. Because uh, we know how this game works with monetary policy, okay? We know, we know from the 60s and 70s and 80s that if interest rates are put in the hands of the political classes, then they will swing with the electoral cycle. And longer term, that leads to higher inflation and less good outcomes. Well, it turns out the self-same thing is true of financial crises. The, on average, what happens is that during the good times, perhaps even the run-up to an election, you tend to play a bit loose on the regulatory side, and that in turn sows the seeds of crisis future. How to solve that problem? Well, you delegate that decision-making over interest rates, 97, over regulation, 2013, to a body, could be a central bank, could be someone else, who is arm's length, but is arm's length from the political process. And that, for me, is a sensible uh, allocation of responsibilities. Now, it is a responsibility. And you know, we at the bank certainly take it hugely, um, um, fully understand that this is not, in no way, shape, or form, unfettered power. We have to sing for our supper. The most famous central bank, Bank of England governor, was a funny chap called uh, Montague Norman, who presided for 20 odd years as governor uh, during the 20s and uh, 30s. He had a selection of spectacularly good quotes, many of them deeply inappropriate. Um, let me give you a couple of uh, examples. He said, I think it was actually in Parliament, uh, never apologize, never explain, if you're a central bank. Keep the press out of the bank and the bank out of the press. That was thinking circa 1930. It would be an intolerable position 
for the Bank of England to be in now, in a situation where responsibilities and powers have been vested in us. We need to explain, and we do uh, explain, and sometimes we even apologize. And the press are never out of our building these days, and we are very rarely out of the press. And that is part and parcel of having these delegated powers and responsibilities. We have to be transparent. We have to explain ourselves. We have to expl uh, ex expose ourselves to external scrutiny and, yes, criticism, and take it on the chin. This is a, a, a brave new world, but for me, it's a better world than the one we've had. I mean, uh, Montague Norman, uh, f famously, uh, when uh, the pound left the, uh, the gold standard, he, uh, he was reported to say that he would never wear a, a top hat in public again. <laughs> but um, let me ask one final question, then we'll open it up to the, uh, up to the floor. And that is, looking at the international system, and looking at the international financial regulation, obviously, the Bank of England, along with other central banks, are now crucially involved uh, in the, the Basel III rules, in the setting up of the, of the Financial Stability Board. Um, do you think that these have gone far enough? I mean, I think it, it, it's generally thought the bank thinks the rules haven't gone far enough in, in Basel III, that we haven't actually got enough international cooperation going. and I. I wonder what more you think needs to be, needs to be done what, what, mm. in mm. order to, to safeguard not just this country, but to safeguard the international system. I mean, we're, we're hearing at the moment a lot of fears that China may be on the brink of, of, a, of a major um, financial crisis. Um, I, how well prepared are we against some other major shocks in the international financial system? So um, the key lesson, the object lesson from the crisis is that uh, global finance is a system. And you must, must, must monitor and manage systems as systems. That sounds so obvious, it ought not to need saying. But it was not the thing we did pre-crisis. We managed bank by bank, we managed node by node, and cared too little about the links between those banks, the links between uh, those nodes. We have learned that lesson, and you mentioned Basel III, which are these international rules of the game for banking, an interna generally international agreement, which we need, given that global finance is a system. Um, does that take us far enough? That was your question, Andrew. Uh, for sure it doesn't, because global finance is not just about banks. It's also about insurance companies. It's also about asset management companies. It's also about these funny things we call shadow banks, which do banking business, but don't really go by the name of banks. Uh, we don't yet have international rules of the road for those other institutions, and we probably need to do a better job of putting in place such international rules of the road. Uh, and this body, this international body called the Financial Stability Board, has set about the task of putting in place such international rules of the game. So we've done well on banking. We are doing better on non-banks. The part we are doing least well on, and this goes to the last part of your question, Andrew, is countries, is countries. Because when the node is no longer a bank, or indeed even an insurance company, or a hedge fund, it's a country, we need also to manage the spectrum, the network of countries in a joined up way, as a system, managing the system as a system. And currently, we don't have international rules of the road for how countries ought to behave and what policies they might put in place 
to prevent adverse spillover consequences of actions they might take with their own self-interest in mind. So that is a, uh, for me, a gap. A gap bordering on the chasm in the global financial system. We have this thing called the International Monetary Fund. Is it yet monitoring global finance as a system? No, not yet. Do we yet have rules that tell us what is good behavior and what is less good behavior by a country that fully take into account the spillover consequences of their actions? No, we, no, we don't. That's for the future. Well, thanks very much, Andy. Now let's go into some q and I've got some questions for the uh, uh, Student Society, the Economics and Politics Society. They were going to meet with Andy before the uh, um, before this event, but unfortunately his, his train got stuck at Leicester, so uh, uh, he was late arriving. So here are some, I can't read out all the questions, but here are a few. Um, some of them are fairly uh, um, uh, direct, so uh, I hope you're ready for these, Andy. Uh, the first one, is a relatively independent central bank a prerequisite for a successful economy in the 21st century? Um, and then the second one, um, women, women have been the biggest losers in the crisis, uh, with the FPC only having one female member. What is the Bank of England doing to help women when there aren't any at the top influencing policy? Um, and then the third one that I picked out here, uh, um, what is the, uh, no, as, as, a, as a central banker in financial stability, how do you keep up with private sector banks who are always inventing more and more complicated ways to make money? So three nice easy ones to start off with. Um, the, um, I am pleased to be here actually, that the train, um, the most worrying thing today was, was, was not those questions. Um, so far, it was when the train stopped just outside Leicester, and we saw the driver walking down the middle of the track, uh, past us in a yellow uh, uh, anorak. Um, so um, I apologize for those of the Economic Society that I couldn't see, but there was a very good reason. Um, so your questions. Um, uh, the first one was about independent um, central banks and... Do uh, countries uh, need them? I think, provided we're clear about why we want to delegate certain tasks to a central bank. And that, for me, is the key. You won't want to delegate too much. And certainly, you know, speaking as a central banker, we would not want too much delegated uh, to us. Um, because there is a fine line between what is legitimately a decision uh, for politicians, elected politicians, and what is legitimately a um, uh, a decision for an uh, unelected, uh, delegated third party. The two things I mentioned, interest rates and crisis management, I think legitimately could, in many countries, including this one, have been put in the hands of a central bank. I think when that case is as clear as that, it makes sense. Anything beyond that, I think, takes us into slightly uh, sticky, stickier uh, territory. Uh, now, I can uh, remember the second question. The second one was really, um, what is the Bank of England doing to help women when there aren't any at the top influencing policy? Yeah, so, um, so there's an easy answer to this question. Um, so you mentioned the Financial Policy Committee, of which uh, I am a member. Um, it has uh, one woman of ten, as you say. Uh, the only saving grace there is it has one more than the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, uh, that, is, um, that is not a good position to be in. Uh, I don't think any of us feel that's the right position to be in. Uh, the easy answer to, to your question is that the decisions on membership are not ones for the Bank of England, actually. They, these are um, government uh, decisions. Um, but that's so not at all. Get on to George Osborne. 
I wouldn't, couldn't possibly comment on that. Um, <laughs> the, um, but the, the problem is, is, uh, is real, and I hope over time we can progressively uh, do, um, not just kind of we the Bank of England, you know, but we the financial services sector uh, can do a much better job than we uh, have done historically on, not just on the gender issue, but on the broader diversity question. And then this, the, the, the last question, I mean, it, it, it's really the, the classic question about, about regulation. I mean, can regulators ever keep up with the people they're regulating? And in this case, with very um, um, highly paid and very I inventive, innovative bank, uh, bankers, can regulators ever hope to stay one step ahead? Yeah. So, um, so Charles, Charles Goodhart, who's a... Um, professor at the London School of Economics, a very eminent uh, economist, sums up this problem as um, the regulatory dilemma, he says, uh, is, is akin to uh, bloodhounds being in pursuit of greyhounds. Uh, and that does, all of my metaphors are dog-related, you realize. Um, and that about, uh, that captures it about, about right, um, I think. Um, and the question is, what is the, what is the best response, given that um, those who you're, in, who you're in pursuit of tend on average to be quicker than you, um, certainly better paid than you, uh, and, and sometimes smarter as well? Um, I think the answer is, or one of the answers is, uh, don't run the same race. Don't run the same race. Uh, so, you know, if when faced with a very complex set of banking organizations, if we try and get our arms around that complex organization by putting in place very complex rules, we are destined to lose. We are destined to lose. Because the loopholes will grow, and the banks in question will, will find ways around them. Yeah, a world in which we have regulators perched on the desk of banks. You're pointing at their screen saying, tell me about the spreadsheet. You know you've lost, right? That cannot work as a way of regulating anything, least of all banks. So for me, what this calls for is applying a rather coarser, simple, perhaps even simplistic set of rules of the game for the greyhound to pursue a thick red line beyond which you are very clear they must not tread, and imposing sanctions for those that do transgress. A thick red line is, for me, the best that we as bloodhounds can do. If it's a sequence of thin blue lines of Byzantine complexity, which isn't the worst description of some of our regulatory rule book, uh, I think we've got a problem. OK, so can we take some questions from the audience now? Um, I'll get them in uh, 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 about three questions, and then we'll, we'll come back to speak. Yes, please. There's a, there's a, there should be a roving microphone. Uh, thank you. It's actually a variation of the last question, in that it seems to me to have effective regulation in any sphere, you clearly need effective regulations, you need good quality regulators, but also actually by and large you need people being regulated to broadly go along with the regulations, to actually see some need for them and to accept them. Otherwise they're always going to be trying to find ways around them. Now the sense I get with bankers is that, and I might be wrong, I, I don't meet with them, um, is that they haven't really learned a great deal. The culture hasn't changed. Uh, they know they're likely to be bailed out if things go wrong again. And that makes me worried that however good you are, and however good your regulations are, because the culture of bankers hasn't changed, we could be in a mess again. Okay, thanks. And then there was someone over here. Uh, just over there, please. Thank you. Um, it was about ring fencing. That seems to be the current approach with 
Ooh. handling the sort of um, banks, it's probably going to reduce imp uh, likelihood of things going wrong, but it sounds like it's going to increase the scale if it does. Is there going to be a move towards actual true separation in the banking industry? So. Thanks, Andrew, for the uh, conversation. Uh, picking up on why didn't you know the question, I mean, there were, I think, two sets of signposts which were ignored or treated very differently from where they should have been. One was that things could go wrong in the last 25 years. Blue Arrow, NatWest, BCCI, Bearings. And the second set of signposts, too big to go bust, it was the helping hand along the way there were banks that would have gone bust had they not gone before to other banks. Midland to HSBC, NatWest to RBS, Halifax to Bank of Scotland, and the whole charade culminated in ABN AMRO being sold to the highest bidder, to the bank that went bust in Britain. Do you want to take those three first? Um, I would, so I'll, I'll try and... Um to them in order. Um, to, to the question about culture, I think you are right on the money. Um, so uh, unless you're able to durably alter um, bankers' preferences for taking risk, we are chasing it around the system. We are chasing our tails. So um, I hope um, that the reforms we're putting in place are with an eye to reshaping the incentives facing bankers so that they themselves are more sensitized to the risks they're taking than, than was the case clearly pre-crisis. Pre 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 that, for me, is the... Me if there were one metric of success or failure of the reform program, it is that. Has the leopard changed its... Spots. It is too early to say, is the honest answer, because many of the reforms that I've discussed this evening uh, are yet to be implemented. Including the ring fencing one asked in the second question. So we have to wait and see. Um, what sort of measures uh, might make a difference to a banker's willingness uh, to take risk? Well, one thing is how much they're paid, right? The structure of their compensation. Uh, which is extraordinary relative to pretty much any other industry uh, I've seen. Uh, and did fairly extraordinary things in the 20 or 30 years prior to crisis. So roughly speaking, uh, in 1980, a similarly qualified uh, lawyer was paid the same as a similarly qualified uh, retail banker was paid the same as a similarly qualified investment banker in 1980. Uh, fast forward a bit less than 30 years, 2006, 2007, and that same similarly qualified investment banker was being paid almost four times the amount of the similarly qualified lawyer or retail banker. Something truly extraordinary uh, had uh, gone on. And the truly extraordinary thing uh, was that um, not just investment banks, but um, um, some banks generally were uh, harvesting that return without sufficient accounts taken of the risks they were putting on. Uh, so taking the risk and jettisoning the return, uh, the way around, sorry. Um, we can think of ways of compensating um, bankers in ways that make that much less likely in future. For example, we could require that any bonus is deferred for a lengthy period. We could claw back payments that are made to bankers if the balloon goes up after the fact, and both of those things uh, are now uh, happening. Our hope is that that will be enough to reshape culture, to reshape incentives, to reshape risk-taking. Uh, 
If it's not, we'll have to do more. To ring fencing, um, well, that is intended. I mean, the, the, the proposals in this country uh, are those suggested by a commission led by uh, John Vickers. Uh, and that's, those reforms are essentially to separate off, if you like, the essential bits of banking, for example, the taking of deposits and the lending to small businesses and to households, from the riskier stuff, from the, the, the making of bets, from the underwriting of securities. <clears throat> and, and the hope is that by putting these two activities in separate uh, entities, there's less risk of cross-contamination between them. And that's one of the essences of Vickers uh, proposals. Of course, you could, could go one step further and require complete uh, separation. The reason that, that John Vickers didn't propose that is because he didn't want to rule out the possibility of the risky part of the business supplying money to the, 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 the part that you view as more socially important and socially attractive. So under his proposals, money can't flow from the deposit-taking bit to the investment banking bit, but it can flow in the opposite direction. And that's why he went for this so-called ring fencing as distinct from separation. I think there is some logic uh, to that. Time will tell, uh, as with the first question, on whether that does uh, the trick. And then finally, on uh, too big to fail, you're absolutely right, there's a question here, that um, historically the response to stress has often been to merge or to take over. Uh, that was the response in the past to failing firms, uh, and that has been the response during the course of this crisis, to fuse together two entities, to hope to make it stronger as a whole. That does not always work well. Look at the difficulties that Lloyds Bank has faced in having Halifax Bank of Scotland fused uh, to it. It risks making the large larger, still not too big to fail problem even more acute. I hope that in future we'll have these regimes, these resolution regimes I mentioned, which will not necessitate these emergency rescues. I hope in future also that the regulator has a much beadier eye to takeovers that are misconceived. You mentioned ABM, ANRO, and the takeover by RBS, which with hindsight, the regulator should never have waved through in a month of Sundays. So I hope we have the tools of the trade and the knowledge to prevent that evolutionary um, uh, equilibrium of the large becoming ever larger. But again, time will tell. Um, I think we have time for one, one more round. OK, we'll have one, one more round. And I'll then, be quicker. Um, so have just quick questions. There was, yes, please. Hi. Um, you briefly mentioned macroprudential policy, so I have a quick question about that. It seems to me that macroprudential policy is partly an exercise in leaning against market sentiment, but also public and political sentiment, and taking unpopular decisions at precisely the moment when there is probably least political appetite for them. So it seems that inevitably at some point in the long term there will be a, a public or political backlash against macroprudential policymakers taking unpopular decisions. So my question is, what can macroprudential policy do for the public, and who should be in charge of explaining that to the public? I've seen it suggested that the financial crash started in November 2007, when the United States adopted Basel II with the mark-to-market rule, 
which instantly reduced the amount of capital that American banks were allowed to lend, causing bank lending suddenly to dry up with disastrous consequences. Do you think there's any possibility that the Basel II rules were responsible in this way for triggering the crash? Hiya. Um, yeah, I um, think you were talking about the narrowness um, of economics and talking about inductive rather than deductive reasoning. Um, and the gentleman before was talking about the, the behaviour of bankers. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and I think that this is going to be difficult to change because the education that we receive in economics, I'm an economics student, is very, very narrow. And it's all deductive reasoning. All our core modules are redu deductive reasoning rather than inductive. Um, and we also lack the critical skills, or be, being taught the critical skills to analyse what it is that we're learning and being able to criticise what it is that we're learning. Um, so we're tr really trying to push for change in uh, the way that economics is taught, but we're, we're coming across massive obstacles and it's proving very, very difficult. And you talk about um, practising economists and they seem to be, or you, you say that they, they seem to be changing. Um, academic economists don't seem to be changing in the same way. What advice would you give to students that are trying to push for change in this manner? Okay, Andy. Uh, so let me get the third question first. Uh, so at the, um, uh, at the risk of being refused dinner by my university colleagues, I think just protest. Protest. Um, to pr protest. Stamp your feet. You know, walk out. Um, um, say what you'd like, uh, make clear what you're for as well as what you're against. Um, so there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't and shouldn't have a more uh, pluralist uh, curric curriculum than, than, than has been the case in economics. And there are moves afoot to shift the economics curriculum to make it more uh, pluralist, uh, not just along the inductive deductive line, but you know, reintroducing to, to end where Andrew started. You know, it, bizarre that we stopped having history of thought and economic history as a core part of the economics uh, curriculum. Um, bizarre that there is not more on the dynamics of complex adaptive systems, which are pretty much everything. You know, how can you not have a, you know, all systems are that. How can you not be teaching that? Um, so protest, so you know, a couple of years ago, um, uh, Greg Mankiw, who's an eminent Harvard professor, his class wrote him an letter and said, shape up. The stuff you're teaching ain't any good anymore. You know, we want some different stuff. Students in Manchester, other side of the Pennines, um, uh, same sort of thing. So moves are afoot and change will come from people like you and fellow students. So nudge, nerdle, coax, cajole, shout down. Uh, faculty if they're not giving you uh, what you want. These questions are too important to be uh, ignored. They're too important uh, to be dealt with with models that have been shown through the crisis to be deeply inadequate for making sense of the macroeconomic phenomenon that matter most, which is crises. So um, if all that fails, um, you know, switch subject. <laughs> so, um, uh, sub, so uh, macroprudential. So macroprudential is the recognition that um, regulators and banks are servants, not masters. That's what it's about. It's about ensuring that wider society, the public, get uh, a good deal, a better deal, from the financial services sector. One of the problems we had pre-crisis was that the financial services sector began to view itself as master and not as servant, as not serving its customers. And that, uh, that needs to change. A macroprudential policy is the mechanism uh, through which it changes. It will not be popular. No aspect of, no few aspects of public policy are popular. Uh, it is not a popularity contest. In some ways, central banks were put on earth uh, to take decisions 
that politicians would otherwise find difficult or unpalatable. So we are in the unpopularity uh, business. What we are duty bound to do is to explain why we are taking unpopular actions uh, when we take them. At the time, they may be looked at with some degree of skepticism, but longer term, if you are doing the right thing, yeah, I think the public will know you're doing the right thing and will respect you for that. That has happened during the course of monetary policy over the, uh, over the course of the last 40 or 50 years, and I hope we can get ourselves in a similar position with macro prudential policy over the next 40 or 50 years. It requires us to be humble. It requires us to be open, warts and all, to what we're doing, what we know and what we don't, and doing the best, and longer term, that will serve us okay, I hope. That's certainly the best that we, I think, can do, given, given where we are. And finally, uh, on uh, Basel II and subprime. I think the seeds were sown uh, well ahead of that. The loans had been made. Um, uh, some of the Basel II rules may have made a difficult situation uh, worse. Uh, but the state of balance sheet disrepair was already there. Uh, mark to market uh, is a bit like financial innovation and integration. It is a double-edged sword. It's a good thing when it lays bare the inadequacies of a balance sheet. It is a bad thing when it scares uh, the horses. I think in that situation, the horses were already well and truly scared long ahead, uh, well ahead of uh, Basel II. So it was, it was aiding and abetting, but by no means the, the primitive driver. OK, thanks very much, Andy. Now can I ask uh, Professor <coughs> Tony Payne to come and say a few final words? I promise to be very, very brief, but I do want to thank um, Andrew and uh, Andy on all of our behalf. I certainly learned a lot from that rather um, intense and indeed very mature discussion. I'm going to go into competition with my dog in catching frisbees this weekend to prove <laughs> that I can do better than, than she can. Um, and as for the familiarity heuristic, then in future all of us will have set eyes on Andy Haldane and we'll know his name and when he speaks out in future, by that same token, we're more likely to think he's going to win his first round match than, than not. In a moment, I want to invite you all just to thank Andy and Andrew in, in the conventional way, but I would like you to embrace in your applause a third person that you only saw briefly today scud up onto the stage to try and sort out Andrew's microphone. That was Sperry's administrator, Sarah Boswell, who's been with Sperry since um, Sperry started, and she's, everyone who knows her, I think, will agree that she stamped her warm and enthusiastic and very lively personality and all that we've so far done. Sadly for us, but delightfully for her, she's moving to a new and higher grade position in the university in the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm smiling through this enforced transition, Pro Vice Chancellor, um, with my usual equanimity and a certain amount of gritted teeth. Uh, but seriously, Sarah's been absolutely great for Sperry, uh, and I will, just couldn't miss this public opportunity with so many people here to thank her for all that she's done, and now I'd like you to join in thanking Andy, Andrew, and Sarah for contributing to this most interesting evening.